somebody still is not unmuted. So Radiance, you need to mute yourself if you would, please. And Anything else? No. All right, let's thank try it again. Ava. I want to thank Ava. We always start out by thanking Ava for her tireless uh, service, putting these bloody things up. Thank you very much, Ava, for recording them and for staying with us and for creating this uh, uh, in the first place. And we want to thank um, last week, or last well, webinar since we won't see it. Yes, uh, I particularly want to uh, thank um, uh, Sue and Andy from Mass Ottawa for uh, sitting in for us while we were off uh, in, in the uh, Big Sur area of Northern California. And in fact, we did not have any, uh, we not only didn't have any internet signal, we didn't have any telephone signal because uh, the AT&T won the franchise for putting signal in that part of the world mm -hmm. in Big Sur. And although they tell us that Verizon is negotiating the signal, mm -hmm. we didn't have any. So I'm really glad that uh, uh, that the uh, that Sue and Andy were, were able to carry on for us. And before we uh, start out, uh, we customarily ask if anybody has a pressing issue that they want to bring up. So we'll be quiet for a moment in case somebody has something they'd like to bring up. Just raise your hand. Just raise raise your hand in the in the room. You've got about ten people in the room right now. Hearing nothing, we will move on. I'll introduce Senior Jaime. And uh, Senior Jaime and I will uh, go back probably to uh, 2002, I would think. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, I'm just delighted to uh, have him uh, here tonight. He is an NLP Master Practitioner, a uh, hypnotist, uh, and uh, a musician. Mm -hmm. And he's joined us on other webinars. He's just never been in our home. Right. Mm -hmm. He joined. He was part of the hypnosis uh, workshop that we uh, or work, uh, webinar that we put on uh, some time ago. Mm -hmm. This is the first time we've had him here, and thank you very much for coming. Over. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And uh, you go, let me just have, let you go ahead and introduce your uh, spiritualism. Okay. Yeah. The uh, when when approached to to present. Uh, the discussion here, uh, I, I threw out four topics, and uh, one of them I threw out was this killing the Buddha, which, and, and I'll get into the sort of reason behind it, but first I'd like to open up with a poem because I find that when talking about spiritual matters, the, uh, it, it's often difficult to communicate with words what's going on, and so the, there's a poetic quality when we're trying to parse our spiritual experience anyway. And uh, this poem's from Rumi, uh, 13th century Sufi mystic, uh, translated by the wonderful Coleman Barks, who my slave has a big crush on. Uh, Southern gentleman, great, great poet, translator. Uh, this one's called A Goat Kneels. The inner being of a human being the jungle. Sometimes wolves dominate, sometimes wild hogs. Be wary when you breathe. At one moment, gentle, generous qualities like Joseph's pass from one nature to another. The next moment, vicious qualities move in hidden ways. Wisdom slips for a while into an ox. A restless, recalcitrant horse suddenly becomes obedient and smooth-gated. A bear begins to dance. A goat kneels. Human consciousness goes into a dog, and that dog becomes a shepherd or a hunter. In the cave of the seven sleepers, even the dogs were seekers. At every moment, a new species rises in the chest. Now a demon, now an angel, now a wild animal. There are also those in this open jungle who can absorb you into their own surrender. If you have to stalk and steal from them, steal from them. So, I first 
thought about presenting this topic at uh, the leadership conference several years ago, five or six years ago, and uh, last minute uh, plans prevented me from, from, from teaching this topic, but it really was inspired by a particular experience I had at a conference uh, with a, a very well-known presenter who, who I respect greatly, uh, and he was this was not uh, like Southwest Leather Conference, it was principally oriented around spirituality. But leather and spirit are, in my opinion, pretty much intertwined anyway. Uh, so this was sort of on the SM track of, of uh, the conference. And he was presenting this ritual uh, and discussing the ritual. And I was there with several friends of mine from Dallas, uh, and the, it's one of these things where once they started the ritual, they kind of effectively locked the doors of the, of the conference room, and people were pretty much stuck for the whole ritual there, and it was, uh, it was a very intense, moving ritual, uh, and at the same time, there were some things that, with, with, uh, the friends with whom I was with it didn't quite fit their map of reality. There was you know, a naked guy playing didgeridoo in the background while all this other stuff was going on. And uh, as powerful as, as this ceremony was for many people there, uh, there were probably an equal number of people that kind of left the whole thing perplexed. And it was not through any fault of the presenter, I don't think, uh, but it did kind of raise that question to me of how can we, because because there are so many facets to spirituality uh, within what it is that we do, uh, and by that I mean, you know, be, the big umbrella BDSM, the fetish side, uh, certainly the leather side, uh, there, there are so many little spiritual threads that run through that, that, that connect us to something greater than ourselves, uh, that it's, I think it's essential. I think it's really ultimately a lot of reasons why people seek this stuff out, is they can make meaning of whatever it is that they're doing in life. Uh, and, I just thought that after attending that particular ceremony, I thought it was a, a, an opportunity to discuss if there were, I mean, there certainly are an infinite number of ways that we can talk about spirituality and talk about our own personal truth in SM uh, and spirituality, but uh, see what we could do to kind of get to some some of the more common threads of what's going on here. And uh, what qualifies me to teach this? Uh, I, I don't claim no no great uh, spiritual insight. Uh, I, I have been uh, well I, from a young age. I was, I was raised in the area, so I guess that that makes me a little bit more spiritually tolerant and open-minded than than some people might. But uh, from about age 19, I've been studying Buddhism and I, I took refuge, a Buddhist refuge over 25 years ago. My current slave is a Buddhist. Uh, and, uh, it's, that, that's my, as part of my spiritual truth, my spiritual path. Uh, at the same time, I've had some experiences in SM as a top and to some degree as a bottom. I don't switch very well. But uh, that were definitely transcend, transcendent experiences. Uh, I, I don't necessarily know if I, I would go as far as the ecstatic experiences, but they were transcendent. They've connected me. Uh, we, we flew really high together, uh, and we were connected to something greater than ourselves in that moment. Uh, so I, I certainly, that's part of the attraction, part of what keeps me going back and, and uh, engaging in that. At the same time, I think there are some spiritual practices 
uh, tied in with, with master-slave relationships that uh, are, I don't know if down to earth is, is the corporate word, but they're not, it's not necessarily to borrow the words of uh, someone who we were having this question on Sunday, not necessarily the peak experience, but more the the connecting experience of all this. So I uh, mostly wanted to come out here and discuss that and uh, uh, talk about a, a, a few books that I've read about the uh, not not necessarily just the SM book, but also I, I do want to touch on some uh, sort of universal. I won't say. Well, I, I would call them universal or, or uh, uh, jargon-free ways of, of, of looking at, at some spiritual concepts that I've learned through uh, the world of NLP and uh, through the work of a gentleman named Dr. Stephen Gilligan, uh, who no longer calls himself a, a hypnotist, but he's uh, one of North American's students in Erickson's later life. And, uh, a great teacher, uh, and so I thought that I would kind of throw some of this stuff out here. I, 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 my intention is to make this a discussion and dialogue. So if there's something that people want to talk about, interrupt me at some time, and and I'd be glad to uh, to sidebar or just let it wander wherever it wanders with this. So my understanding is that these are not really intended to be. Classes or lectures, but no. more discussion. I'll ask questions if they don't. Uh, mm -hmm. And people, for those of you, very few of you are new. Most of you are recognized. And welcome to Master of Sitting and Fred Namaste. And hello, Brian. Um, uh, and uh, also Nikita and Ursula. Thanks very much for joining us. Uh, for those of you that aren't uh, are are new, you can just hit the uh, raise your hand uh, figuratively. At the bottom of the of your uh, participant screen, uh, at least on ours, there's a place, there's a little hand image, and if you press that, it signals that uh, you'd like us to call on you. But I that. Well, yes, that's right. She put our hand up. Uh, but <laughs> do you you want to go in? Can tell a little bit about how you, uh, if you are if you are going to make a scene. Mm -hmm. That was either transcendent or somehow spiritual, somehow spiritual, other than simply a straight SM scene. What would you do, or do you? Are there any things that you would recommend others to do? Well, and can it be a repeated? Experience? Or do you want to go over? Well, I, I, I don't necessarily think that you can guarantee that something's going to be a transcendent. Uh, you, uh, all you can do is create the opportunity for that to happen. Uh, uh, having said that, uh, let me let me kind of jump from the the SM world or make a sideways leap into uh, my experience with neurolinguistic programming. And, and in NLP, they have this concept called the neurological level levels, which were basically borrowed from Gregory Bateson. Uh, and Bateson was an incredible thinker, uh, and he talked about there being learning at different levels uh, and changes that can be made at different levels from, from if you can imagine kind of like Maslow's pyramid, mm -hmm. uh, the base of the pyramid would be the environment. So it's things in, in the environment. Uh, the next level up would be behavior. Uh, above that would be capability. Oh, so you have to pick it soon. What do you want me to say? Uh, you're, in, you're coming right on to the Middle of the program. Okay. Okay. All right. So. So you are in uh, environment, okay. behavior, capabilities. Capabilities above that would be beliefs. Uh -huh. Above that would be values. Uh -huh. Above that would be identity. And that's for a long time in NLP. That's where the pyramid stopped. Mm -hmm. And then people were saying, well, you know, what what could be above that? Or what, are there seen certain kinds of changes, organizational changes? Saying you know this isn't really an identity, there's something beyond that. It's a, it's a broader purpose, and uh, that is uh, you tie that in with with uh, 
Gregory Bateson's idea of, of sphere as, as being this pattern of mind that goes beyond the individual mind, more of a, a collective consciousness model. And uh, so I would say uh, one way of, of doing it really intentionally and purposefully, and certainly we could add as much kinky flavor and pageantry as we want into this as we do this by by way of protocols or by way of establishing certain kind of thresholds in terms of uh, escalating our consciousness as we went along to simply start by uh, setting, in, setting an intention that we're going to uh, try and connect to something greater than ourselves through our play together and start that with the environmental level, uh, you know, back in in our SM101 days, all about setting the scene. So and something that, that that can be done collectively or individually by the top. I mean, uh, it really depends on what kind of relationship you're talking about. If, if you're at a play party, you know, there's there's only so much you can do with the environment. But you start there, and then you would go into the behaviors, which could just simply be uh, a set of behavioral constraints or opportunities or mm -hmm. whatever. Then from that, uh, you go to capabilities and capabilities. Again, it's what the bottom is capable of, what the top is capable of, and, and keeping holding that attention. And uh, through that, just thinking about what beliefs collectively bottom and top share in that experience what values collectively they hold, and ultimately what is the shared identity they have, even if it's just in the context of that scene, you know, it's just this momentary chance meeting of two star prop souls, whatever. Um, and then if you can if you can kind of step through all that, uh, there's I would say there's a there's a good chance of having spiritual connection through that. Obviously, uh, the more practiced one is, the more refined our capabilities are. And that kind of goes to uh, the issue of mastery of a particular technique or skills or set of skills. Mm -hmm. And by mastery, I mean this confidence, unconscious confidence. Okay. Uh, and uh, so that, that would be one way of doing it. I mean, I think ultimately the shorthand version of that is just to set an intention and to hold that intention. And uh, certainly one of the opportunities that we have when we play in public or even in private, if there's more than two people there, is uh, uh, the opportunity for witness. Mm -hmm. And I find that a very powerful spiritual lever as well, having someone witness not not necessarily uh, from the bread and circuses entertainment value of it, but to really appreciate uh, the shared experience, whether that's an ordeal, whether that's fun, whether that's uh, some really refined acts of service, whatever that is. Uh, but just having someone witness that and appreciate that and use that as a way of kind of spinning up the appreciation. So I'd like to ask uh, the people that are, uh, everybody else in the room, whether you, uh, whether anybody is willing to uh, speak about uh, any processes, uh, any uh, patterns uh, or paths that you yourselves have found to be particularly effective in establishing a spiritual link uh, in your play. Or relationship. Or relationship, period. Now, how do you get to spirituality in your relationship? Anybody want to uh, chime in on that one? Nikita. Go ahead, Nikita. Well, it's Ursula here. Um, Hi, Ursula. Welcome back. Thank so, you. <laughs> there's a couple of ways that um, for us that we can do it. Obviously, it's limited to space and uh, 
uh, privacy and things like that, often when we're at a public place party, it comes down to intent um, as much as anything and our, our, our energy exchange, basically. When we're at a public place party, for me, it's like there's nobody else there. Uh, because you know us, we have a very strong connection, so our energy exchange is very, it's very strong and, and very easy to maintain and, and keep up. Um, when we're in, in more private play, there are certain um, tools that we can help to even enhance that experience because of our shared beliefs. There are certain things that are, are much more, they're very sacred to us, like uh, elements, so fire play is a very a very spiritual, very uh, sacred experience for me. Um, we just got this fantastic stone dildo made out of this big, heavy piece of granite that, again, it's a very elemental, you know, for for because we're both pagan, for me to be, you know, fuck with that is just unbelievably profound. You know, just that experience. So we find things that um, have meaning to us and have value to us as far as our our spirituality, and we were able to incorporate those things into play quite easily. Um, blood is also a very important, uh, very profound, sacred thing for us. So blood play is is also very spiritual, and and that a lot of that is what it comes down to. It's very easy for us to find uh, props. We could you could say, to aid in the experience. Uh, okay, Ursula, do you do anything with music uh, or anything with setting at all? Um, I have uh, a great affinity for sound. You know me, I play the harp, so um, I often I often enjoy some softer music. I often find dungeon music is, is too heavy for me, and I have to tune it out most of the time. Um, so we actually often play Enya in the background. Not everybody's first choice, but I really like it. And it, it actually creates quite a, uh, ease, ease of experience for me as far as, you know, transcendence. Yeah, at the play parties in Austin for many years, uh, we had, uh, a DJ, a good friend of mine, uh, and uh, he would he would always throw a little India in there. He'd throw everything from uh, from sixties psychedelic music to India. And, and, <laughs> and uh, it, it worked always you know, his, he always had, he had a really good way of sequencing things. So when he kind of perceived that, that things were needed a little chilling out, he put some in uh, mm -hmm. when they needed some ramping up, he put some more rhythmic mm -hmm. Very nice. That's very nice. Well, and we'd probably choose different music if we were doing uh, a drumming circle or a drumming scene that um, implemented by cloggers or whips or something. It would probably be hand. hand yeah. Hand. Yeah. In this I one, still want, this I still one's want a, a hand, drum circle. A drum circle. I still need a drum circle that's a bunch of dominants and their bottoms, bottoms. <laughs> <laughs> Sign me up. <laughs> <laughs> so when uh, when I used to when I was setting an intent with my former slave to do a spiritual scene, uh, we had a, a regular process that we go through that would start with her uh, cleansing the room with sage, mm. uh, and we always had dim lights. And we played uh, there's uh, there we played what's called shamanic music. Mm. Uh, which is sort of eerie and new age. And uh, I would, uh, she, with her, uh, touching her with about 10 or 12 times with a um, uh, uh, hot needle, a devil's fire, mm -hmm. so popping, uh, her eyes would roll back and she'd be gone. She, and in her case, she'd be astral traveling. Wow. And uh, she would always come back with a message, mm -hmm. uh, which then we'd then sit around and try and puzzle through for the next mm -hmm. hour or so after she recovered. But I had to be very careful on how long I would leave her out mm -hmm. uh, because it became it, uh, it was it would almost take as long to to get her back yeah. as she was out. Uh, and I, I I found that if I let her out more than about ten minutes, uh, I really was having trouble getting her back. So mm -hmm. I stopped doing it mm -hmm. uh, for long times. 
But we, we, we found there was a pattern to what we could do in that sense. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when, when you did that, uh, was it uniformly successful for you? Yeah, pretty much. Uh, I, and I'm, I was I was always very I was always on alert. So she's the only one traveling. Mm -hmm. uh, I was monitoring as guide. Mm -hmm. But uh, and even and with uh, with master now, mm -hmm. if we set if we decide that we're doing a uh, a spiritually connected uh, evening, mm -hmm. uh, we we have a, a pattern and a path mm -hmm. that gets us there pretty effectively. Mm -hmm. So yeah. But I'm also I'm interested in anybody else sharing what they do. Come on, guys. It's a room. Yeah. Astro City and Namaste. I've been possibly <laughs> <too> quiet. <laughs> I can't do it. They're probably doing spiritual play, right? Don't do it. <laughs> you teach this. Well, um, I it. guess. Are you hooked up? Yes. I guess the um, the question that I that's primary in my mind right now, mm -hmm. following what Ursula was talking about is um, can, can that kind of connection, that kind of spiritual connection, mm -hmm. um, be something that, uh, that you can share with multiple partners, or, or does it require a specific relationship? I, I don't think so. I, you know, I... Uh, I've talked several times already about how I think leather and spirit are kind of intertwined. If you look at the, the history of leather, and uh, I mean, we just finished reading Leather Folk uh, for the book club here in Austin. Uh, and if you uh, read through that book, they I mean, we've over talked about spirituality and a lot of stuff. and. Uh, not so overt stuff, but you know, and that's intertwined with uh, uh, sport fucking. You know, it, it's uh, and part of the the leather spirit, as I understand it, and you know, I identify as leather, but I I can't claim any direct lineage of transmission to uh, the the real heyday and crucible of, of, of in which leather was forged, but my understanding of uh, that, and I kind of lost my train of thought, really, but uh, the, what, what's, uh, what my understanding of that is, uh, part, of, part of the leather archetype is, is this donning of the armor, the leather armor, the organic Identity and, and it, it basically assuming an a, a, a ultra masculine, ultra sexual archetype. Uh, and uh, that's to me, that's very much setting an intention. And it's not so much setting an intention to delve deeply into I mean, it's, it's intimate, but it's, it's a different kind of intimacy than, mm -hmm. than one you might share with, with a primary partner. Mm -hmm. But uh, I would imagine that uh, in the catacombs, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of very moving, very spiritual experiences going on uh, in in bars like that. Uh, so I don't necessarily think that. It, I mean, I I think there's a particular refined uh, sort of experience that that can come from from uh, a primary partner and and using SM as a, as a vehicle for connecting and reconnecting and, and uh, really honing the blade of your relationship. Uh, but I, I think that's just one path of many. Ursula and Nikita? Um, Nikita here, I just wanted to make a, a uh, perhaps a, a, a partial answer to, to Ben's question there. Um, yes, you, you can have a spiritual experience without a very specific close relationship, um, but I can see that's going to be something that's a one-sided 
spiritual uh, spiritual experience. Uh, think of it like the preacher speaking to the congregation. It's a shared experience, but each experience is generally very individual and separate. Um, but at least they have the shared connection of beliefs, which which is where it becomes critical to allow the two people to create that experience. If you don't have some shared um, spirituality, then you're not talking the same language. And I mean, it doesn't mean having identical spirituality, it just means having a sheer, shared spirituality. Um, We've had some experiences like that at um, just at BDSM conferences and yes. classes that were very spiritual and very profound for us. And that was just completely unintentional, I'm sure. Also, maybe it was. Maybe it was the intention of the teacher to try and create that. And we we were able to pick up on that, and um, we had BDSM in common, which was lovely. It united us. I'm just making notes. Good stuff. Thank yeah. you. <laughs> but but back to the 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 ideal situation, at least from my perspective. Um, so that when when Ursula and I um, play in a fashion where where um, it's interesting. Our spiritual nature is such that I don't feel like anything that we do together doesn't encompass an aspect of that. So we might have an intent to take it to another level, to have that extremely deep spiritual experience. But every time we play, even if it's just at a play party, if there isn't that desire to have that spiritual energy exchange, we're not going to play. Hmm. Even if I'm just having what to other people looks like an extremely good, intense um, physical sensation play scene with her with lots of flogging and whip and, and scourge and hand touches and spanking, whatever else. There's always, always that energy exchange between us, and that energy exchange is part of our spiritual following, our belief. You should be bored otherwise. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so we always have that, and, and it is it's part of our, it's part of our faith, though. Exactly. So. Okay. Anybody else want to share about uh, how they use spirituality or how the, the path they use to get to a spiritual experience? That's what I'm going for. Well, Cooks is writing really um, profound information here, and I'd like him to be able to. Cooks, what, how about just speaking? Keying your mic and speaking. Do we have to read this? No, we can read this. Go ahead, Master. His mic is not working. Mic's not working. Okay. Master will read it. Okay. I really hate reading. I don't even have my glasses on. Okay, I can read it a little smart. Right uh, in SM as a top, I found it helpful to empty myself, to clear my head of intention and distraction, and to get this lucid, deep listening space where my actions become almost automatic. And the placement and intensity of blows is revealed in the totality of the bottom and or the universe and the moment to help induce transcendence in bottoms, some combination of bondage plus pain plus ego destruction, uh, where the object uh, is to, dis to subtract the agency of movement and security and dignity and other attachments that they may have to the physical world. The strategy is subtraction plus negation, uh, clearing the space. I think the work of taking it from catharsis to transcendence uh, to be private and entirely in their court. That's marvelous. Uh, we need to save that. Mm -hmm. and I want to build on a couple of things. Sure. At Butchman's mm -hmm. uh, experience, they uh, had us, uh, uh, one of the exercises was to flog, the tops were to flog the bottom uh, blindfold. Okay. No, 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 no. Was it blindfold? No. What was it? No. no. 
Um, you Astra were, will tell me the way it is. <laughs> you were you were to um, wait until you have the, the the spirit that told you to strike and where to strike and how to strike. You didn't want to. Had my eyes open. You had your eyes open. Hmm. Hmm. All right. Ah, the spirit must have taken your eyes. I have your sight. I have a I have a, 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 a slight gra a, a slight hold on my memory at any at, at best of time. Mm. Uh, but uh, that's very good, uh, and that that uh, what you're saying, folks, is similar to what uh, uh, um, Guy Baldwin is saying. Guy Baldwin mm -hmm. in ties that bind. Uh, about stressing the uh, body through DS and stressing the to stressing the mind through DS and stressing the body through SM, mm -hmm. uh, and you've phrased it very well on the issue. And uh, yeah, period. I'll say you did a great great job mm -hmm. at that. Very cogent. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I don't. The only observation I would have is uh, based on what you've written, and certainly. I'm sure that's just the tip of the iceberg of your experience. Based on what you've written, I would actually say the intention is to be that listening post, that that listening uh, thing, and and, uh, and uh, you know you can take that for whatever that's worth. That's my observation. I mean, I think we're all kind of tied into uh, different purposes and missions as tops and as masters and, and bottoms and slaves. So this is depending on uh, and that some of us are still finding them. For myself, uh, I I tell people that I'm interested in being in a relationship with that uh, one of my number one purposes is to take them outside of their comfort zone. And uh, I would not go so far as to say I'm a real master or, or anything like that, but. Uh, I just find that that's where the opportunity for growth is, is outside of my comfort zone. So whether that's in the context of, of pain or, or taking a nice big enema, or or whether that's in the context of uh, just some uh, developing slave protocols, cultivating obedience, cultivating uh, certain things that I as a master want to cultivate in my flow. Uh, and it sounds like Coke's purpose in terms of his play is to sort of uh, ego transcendence and uh, a bit of the ordeal thing and, and I'd say that, that whole listening thing that connecting with 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 whatever that spirit is, that, that sense of spirit is, and using that as a vehicle to, to let him know where to go with that. And, you know. Master Obsidian, go ahead. Uh, okay. Can you hear us? I can hear y'all. Awesome. awesome. Hey! Welcome. 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 <laughs> Um, one of the things that I would observation that, that we we both have about that, um, including spirit or spirituality in the whole experience, is that I guess well, on one hand you can look at it as the top or the master as being facilitator and allowing the slave or the bottom to have their own experience, but I think in the context of the MS relationship that really that doesn't work as well because in the MS dynamic, the desire for the um, person who is the recipient of my actions, in this case, Namaste, is that her desire is to go where I want to go. So I can't necessarily leave her to her own devices to have her own experience. What I am is, is directing and guiding that experience in the area that I want it to go to. And, and it's her desire that that would happen. So she would feel somewhat bereft if I just said, okay, well, you just do your own thing. And let me know how it goes. And just give me feedback as to where you would like to go. Because um, that wouldn't, that wouldn't, well, in the MS dynamic, everything serves my relationship dynamic. And so even that, in terms of the shared experience of that play, also, 
and the spiritual components also serve the nature of our relationship. Yeah, if Master left me to, if he guided me and facilitated this experience but didn't um, fully impart his will as a part of it, I would not feel safe to let go and have whatever kind of experience, which is, I think, um, from my understanding, um, is part of the a component of butchment as well, is being able to, that's one of the reasons why they suggest if you're paired, if you're coupled, that you switch so you can allow yourself to have the experiences you're going to have. But within our relationship, my desire is always going to be obedience and surrender. So I, I need to know he got me and that he's, he's fully invested in that and he's directing it as opposed to um, leaving me alone because that just doesn't work. <laughs> so. so that's our two chuckles. Yeah. Okay. It, it, um, I heard the words. I don't know how to make that practical. How do you guide a spiritual trip? I mean, if your intention is to have a spiritual trip, how do you guide it? Well, I mean, I, to me, the intention is not just to, I mean, it can be something simple, okay, let's go and, and see what's out there in the gospel for us. But uh, typically, when in the context of play, I mean, and, and uh, I may be putting words into Matthew's mouth, but I, I think it's even outside of the context of play and the spirituality of the MS dynamic, uh, it's, it's setting the intention of whatever it is that you as the master want to bring forth and have that connected with your deeper sense of spiritual purpose, whatever that is. That's not necessarily the same as Seeking out an ecstatic experience, and seeking out uh, an ecstatic experience, which I mean, and, and those, those that could be the intention too, but that's uh, at least in the context of, of their relationship. If he wants to guide her to an ecstatic experience, my guess is that he's going to be right there along with her, and uh, perhaps we'll learn more about that at the home workshop. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else want to uh, add in on this topic? Or change the direction. Or change the direction. Well, I have to go over some of the books. I yeah, I mean, I, I, lots about the actual books themselves and some of the concepts in them. Uh, I mean, there, there are lots of books on SM and spirituality. You recommended uh, Sensual Sadie's book, which I have not read, called Spiritual Transformation through BDSM. Great list of authors there, so I'm looking forward to reading that. Uh, uh, the book I have here is Sacred Pink by Lee Harrington, and uh, the reason I've, I've brought that up is I, I think Lee's done a, done a, an excellent job of uh, in in the spirit of uh, certain spiritual masters who have to be loose maker. Uh, has uh, divided uh, spiritual exploration into eight different paths, uh, and uh, he uh, puts the path of rhythm, path of the ordeal path, path of the flesh, the path of ritual, the path of breath, the path of the horse, uh, which may or may not be fun for it's really more about <laughs> transformation, I think. Uh, Path of Asceticism and the Path of Sacred Plants, which would be smoke and perhaps entheogens. Uh, and uh, I, I think, I think that's when, when I set forth this intention of uh, trying to figure out ways of discussing SM. And spirituality, I think it's valuable to try and establish some sort of common language. I think Lee's done, done, a, done a good job with that. The uh, caveat I would put on that from my personal experience is that uh, is the idea of spiritual materialism, which uh, uh, this is a book I read many, many years ago, when I was first beginning to practice, uh, 
written by um, uh, Tibetan Rinpoche, Jogun Kukpo Rinpoche, who's no longer with us. He ranked himself to death. He's a very complicated guy. Uh, uh, but uh, really a great teacher for the West. And he came in, came to the States in the 60s and the heyday and everything that was going on in the 60s and all the spiritual seeking and, and growth that was coming out of the 60s. And uh, he uh, kind of observed this sort of spiritual window chopping going on, which he, he coined spiritual materialism. And uh, let's see if I can find. I have a quote marked out here. I lost my place. Uh, basically, the idea from from the Buddhist perspective, uh, the goal of spiritual practices is to be fully present in this world, and whatever you use as a vehicle for that. Uh, is great from a Buddhist perspective, but ultimately, if you're clinging to a label like, oh, I'm an ordeal master, or I'm following the path of the Lord, and you're clinging to that too tightly and not really engaging in the fruits of spirit, which are things like compassion, love, connection, all those things, then uh, you're in his opinion, being a spiritual materialist, and, and in my opinion, too. And I certainly don't think that's what he is trying to say in the book, but that's uh, sort of the, sort of lurking in the shadows of all this, and, and the potential for risk in all of this. And, and uh, I think now that we are able to discuss our spirituality so, so openly within the context of uh, BDSM and leather and at conferences and stuff, the risk is it just becomes one more thing on the checklist. And to me, that's the complete antithesis of, of uh, what spirituality is. It's, it's something that, uh, it's not something from the Chinese menu of that's all stuff that we do. It's, it's uh, I guess I would argue it's the reason why we do all the reasons. Why we can appreciate the flavors of what we need, if that makes sense. I've lost everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Want to introduce any of the other books? Uh, well, uh, uh, one more. The only other book I brought was uh, Spirit of Desire, which is the companion book to uh, Sacred King. And uh, the reason I like this book is because a very much of little tiny little essays, probably much like Sensuous Sadie's book, about everybody's individual spiritual experience. So we can kind of see the the myriad of perspectives and, and in my opinion, where they are in their spiritual development. I think there's some people that uh, I would argue are a little bit more on the spiritual materialist side, but uh, it's it's a great read and a, a great way of uh, looking at it, it's a, it's a great compliment to the sacred thing. So I would encourage those that are interested to pick up both books. Are there is there anything that you do personally in your uh, in your life, mm -hmm. uh, particularly with your Buddhist uh, proclivities, mm -hmm. to keep yourself mindful and focused? Well. Uh, we, my slave and I have slightly different approaches to meditation, but we both meditate. We, we have admittedly not been sharing joint meditations more than we want to, so that's one of, uh, one of our intentions. I mean, definitely, I think, uh, in the context of play, for example, as I'm play, uh, if things aren't going right, the first thing I check is, you know, where is my physical center? You know, am I in my body? Uh, and I mean, I think that's really one of the benefits of SM play is that it's a body centered practice, ultimately. That's one of the reasons why, uh, I enjoy rope so much because it's body centered and it's in close with my partner as opposed to throwing a whip, which I understand can also be 
a very powerful way of spiritually transmitting whatever you transmit into the world, as Master Skip has taught. Uh, but uh, I, I think uh, you can't do a body-centered practice if you're not in the body. Mm-hmm. And so, I mean, you know, uh, one of the things that I've been taught is that you have at least three minds, you know, the one up here, the one here, and then the what we could call spirit or the field mind, the shared experiential mind, or whatever's going on in our immediate surroundings, in our broader surroundings. Uh, and uh, for me, SM play starts here, not here. Um, you know, I mean, this goes on all the time. Anyway. Mm-hmm. It's just being being in, in your heart, right, in your center. Mm-hmm. And uh, uh, returning to breath uh, is, is a big thing for us, too. Okay. Did you have another topic, or should we uh, well turn back to the uh, to the group? Well, the only other topic I have, I mean, it's just this is again. I was talking about Dr. Stephen Gilligan, uh, and it's it's a very simple uh, and deep concept in terms of discussing spirituality or discussing engagement with uh, another human being, or for that matter. Well, uh, and those are what he calls the three archetypical energies of sponsorship. And uh, those energies are playfulness, tenderness, and fierceness. And uh, he argues, and this is, in the, this is not in the context of all that. He's not a, an SM practitioner. He's probably gnashing his teeth right now if I'm saying this, but. Uh, in the context of, of being in relationship or there's a therapeutic relationship or just simply in relationship with yourself or another, uh, you're bringing all of those energies to bear. And from moment to moment, the question is, which one is sort of taking the lead? Uh, you know, uh, the, the tenderness does not mean maudlin emotion. It just means that vulnerability, that that openness and sensitivity. The, ten- the playfulness doesn't necessarily mean acting the fool. Uh, it's just, it's just injecting humor into the situation. And, and to a certain degree, uh, uh, that creative energy, that creative spark that, that uh, inspires us. And then the fierceness uh, is not brutality. It's, it's strength. It's, uh, uh, Standing your ground uh, as needed, and uh, conviction. So, uh, I think those are uh, those are things that I find as touchstones, uh, particularly in, in in relationship with my slave. It's like, you know, which one am I bringing to the bear right now to to uh, be our most authentic selves and be fully present and committed to our relationship. And sometimes that's fierceness, but a lot lately it's been a lot of tenderness. So, uh, and but it's, it's always a mix. You know, I would not say that at one moment I'm pure tenderness or pure fierceness or pure playfulness. Uh, so I just wanted to throw those out there because I think that's a nice common language that we can use uh, in lieu of uh, the Chinese menu of, you know, I will give you an ordeal today, or I will uh, take you down the path of rhythm. On the other hand, you know, if if, if the path of rhythm is calling you, well, who spoke of that? And again, I would say that all three of those energy people are for sure. I have a question. Mm-hmm. It's a long question. Sure. Sure. Um, we have somebody new in our life who is new to uh, this lifestyle. Mm-hmm. And um, she specifically asked about uh, incorporating um, spirituality with this type of play. Mm-hmm. Um, what came up for me was um, somebody once said that they hit a place in their play that they were afraid of. Mm. 
So if you're new to the to this world, mm -hmm. um, I remember when I was new and I hit a, a level of sensation that I'd not where I'd not been before mm -hmm. and how frightening that was. And um, so is there any way to explain to somebody who has not experienced a spiritual uh, ride um, so that they can relax into it and that it's not frightening for them? Well, I don't necessarily think there's one thing you can... How do you know you're there? Yeah. How <laughs> do you know it's okay? Yeah, I mean, you can certainly do all that. I mean, I do think that uh, if if that's if you're if it's your intention as the top or a master or whatever it is in the context of the relationship to take someone on the spiritual ride, I mean, and again, we've heard from some people say that's the only reason why we play. Uh, if if you're dealing with a novice, I mean, you, you know, I I do think you have to go beyond that. You may experience a very strong sensation, or a useful sensation. I, you know, I, I would probably say, in the case of someone like that, assuming that I wasn't just consumed by luck, uh, I would probably say uh, something to the effect of, uh, there's a lot of things that, that I mean, I, again, I, I start with my job to take you outside of the problem. So. There are some, some things that you may not be entirely comfortable with. There may be some things that uh, are hopefully beyond your experience. And hopefully you are you open to, to new experiences. Uh, I want you to understand, obviously, that, that I'm here and that whatever happens, I will take my responsibility and you will take your responsibility to make sure we get you back to back down to planet and birth at the end of this. Um, in the meantime, uh, let's enjoy the ride. I, I remember when I was hitting those peaks when I first started, that mm -hmm. I had to make the conscious decision to allow it to happen. Yeah, yeah, and certainly, uh, I mean, as a hypnotist, when I was doing class, if I want it to happen, let it happen, allow it to happen, mm -hmm. give yourself permission. I mean, that, that's part of in the logical levels, belief is this belief, this intention of giving yourself permission. The belief that I have the permission. I, not only am I, uh, do I give myself permission to this, but I, I'm, in, I'm, I'm not entitled, but I, I, uh, I'm receptive to this. I'm, I'm a, an open channel to whatever's going on out there. And, uh, certainly part of what scares us sometimes is just, uh, the union concept of the shadow. Just, you know, we're seeing, seeing dark parts in ourselves that, I mean, that's part of the reason why a lot of us seek this out to begin with. It is mm -hmm. you know, dark and nasty. It's not the So, uh, I think that's another thing you could talk about. Is that, you know, you're not here, uh, to take the kitty ride. You're here to ride the, Texas Rattler roller coaster, mm -hmm. and you know, are, are, if you're prepared to do that, let's get on board and start the ride. Mr. Obsidian. I think it is important is that um, we talked a little bit about remaining present, but I, I always say, you know, you need to ask yourself. Sometimes, constantly, when am I? You know, if I'm not now, when am I? Because if I'm in my past, if I'm in my future, um, a lot of times when we think about those things that scare us and make us fearful, um, and it's not now. It's like, what happens after this? Well, this reminds me of something that happened before. Well, how am I going to process this when something bad happened in my past? And all of those things, are not now. They're either in the future or in their past. And as long as we remain present now and we have that other that's with us, doesn't matter which end of the whip you're on, then I think through that connection, then that becomes a viable pathway to whatever spiritual experience we want to have and have that be a positive spiritual experience. 
as opposed to um, the negativity that very easily jumps on us when we start getting fearful. And typically that fear comes from um, not being now, being some other way. That's very good. That's very good. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody want to add something? We're coming right up at 9 o'clock, um, uh, the end of the hour. Uh, would anybody like to add anything or uh, ask Senior Jaime uh, anything else at this point? Yeah, there's uh, the – I kind of hate to bring it up because I'm not one to point at the boogeyman in the closet, but uh, there – with all these spiritual technologies that we have and our – Back and call with appropriate mastery and appropriate intention. Uh, there, there are potential pitfalls to this. To this. Uh, before we started, I talked to you about uh, Dossie Eason, uh, who uh, uh, co-founder of Greenery Press uh, and was teaching uh, some tantra stuff. Uh, based on their book, Radical Ecstasy. And she experienced a, uh, after doing tantric practice for a while, started spontaneously experiencing the incredibly intense, spontaneous energy orgasms, for lack of a better word, ecstatic experiences. Uh, and ones that she really couldn't control, she couldn't shut them off. So they're, they're again, you know, I. She she she's written an article about this on salon.com. Uh, I I can't remember the title of the article, but uh, and to sort of gives you a, a a taste of how terrified and how uh, how challenging this was for her. She, she got through it, uh, but uh, just as with anything, take responsible take personal responsibility. Or whatever it is that you're doing or planning on doing, and understand that uh, that there are risks involved, and, and uh, you know, as, as much as again, because of the language of spirituality is pretty esoteric at times, there's, these risks are, are less spelled out, but they are there. Uh, and but I can assure you that. Uh, my experience is that if, if uh, everybody that's involved in whatever spiritual stuff you're doing, whether it's of MS or SM or whatever, uh, if everybody in a relationship is is taking their share of the responsibility, you will get through it. But just be apprised that there are risks. When when Master and I uh, play, have an, uh, we know. Normally, we decide that we're. She decides that we're going to have a particular kind of intense play in life. Mm -hmm. When we do those, we're. It takes us a couple of days to recover from. Mm -hmm. They're extremely energy draining. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, they're 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 really spectacular. They're what I call silver box experience. Mm -hmm. But um, boy, does that take some recovery. Mm -hmm. And longer and longer, the older we get. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anybody else? Before we close it down, anyone that hasn't had a chance to speak, which is most of you. <laughs> do we know what? Oh, yes, we do know what our next webinar is about. Oh, yeah. CDT for Father's Day. Um, oh, yes, we have Master Tandir, uh, who had a heck of a time finding a uh, a male candidate that didn't already know of him <laughs> and went screaming from the room. However, I have I have it on good authority that she's found somebody that will hold still or sort of still mm. or at least allow himself to be bound long enough for Master Tandir <laughs> to uh, work on him, as it were. Mm. So that's for the fourth, that's our fourth of July. No, that's, our father, father, that's our Father's Day event. Right. So we hope to see everybody back in two weeks. And we have Badara doing blood play on for wow. 4th of July. July. We, we had to do something red. So red, red, white, and blue. All we could so think of was blue. Right. So that's yeah. it. Well, thanks very much. Thanks. Yes. Thank, yes, thanks, Senior Honey. Thank so much for coming. It was marvelous. Thank you all. We will have you back for some of your other topics. Okay, great.
Master Sidian, uh, say namaste. Thanks for joining us, uh, Nikita and uh, Ursula, uh, Brian, and Anka. Thank Papa you very much. Murph. Papa Smurf. Uh, no fun. Oh, thanks for joining Apple us from Dallas. Anka Asirsi. Asirsi. And then a and then a phone 